Hi, um, my name is Albert again. Um, the topic I'm going to talk about today is uh, innovation for everyone. And the reason I put the word everyone in quote is because I hear a lot of uh, uh, faces, whether it's slogan or emission statement, they talk about this uh, internet technology is going to make everyone's life so much easier. And this technology, this product in my hand is going to make everyone's, it's going to change everyone's lives forever. But um, as Matthew already, already present, if you check the latest number, 60% of the world population don't even have internet access. How can we change everyone's life with that? And if you look at the, the, the kind of technology that we present to everyone that's supposed to change everyone's life, um, if you look at the price tag, uh, you, you can be quite sure that they don't, when they say everyone, they don't mean the 80% of people who earn less than 10 US dollar per day. And they certainly don't mean to include those 50% of people who earn even less than 2.5 US dollar per day. So, um, but that's fine. I mean, uh, um, basically what we have been doing all our life is um, our, our most intelligent people, they have been designing things to serve the top, not top, the wealthiest 20% of population in the world. And that's all we have been doing. But the trouble is even serving only the wealthiest 20% of the population in the world, we constantly have the trouble of finding innovators and leaders to lead the changes. So my, 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 my question is, if one day we really want to serve everyone, including the 80% of the population, how can we come up with in enough innovators and leaders to lead all the changes that will actually benefit the living, the life of this, uh, um, this population? So that's my, my topic today. And what I have today is um, I, I, I'm bringing along two stories to share with you. One is uh, about this guy called Albert, um, um, myself. I'm, I was an engineer. Uh, I always tell people I was born as an engineer. I know it's impossible, but I'm, I'm very typical Chinese. I'm good at maths, I'm good at physics, and, and I'm just naturally terrible in, in history and, and arts and literature. So um, no surprise I became an engineer. I studied mechanical engineering, industrial engineering. My research was in artificial intelligence, in robotics, engineering all my life. So I uh, can be quite sure I'm not going to be the wealthiest person, but I will you know, have a good life. And as I progress, as I gain my experience, I will have a bigger, fatter paycheck as I go. Um, so that was my life. But when after, five years after I graduated from college, I decided um, I have enough experience and I want to see the world a little bit before I, I charter as an engineer because I know as soon as I charter, I will sit very uh, uh, squarely in front of my computer for the rest of my, my life. So I joined MSF, um, um, Doctors Without, Without Borders in, um, in, in um, English. Um, the first assignment I, I received was in South Sudan in year 2000. Um, when I was there, there was a, a civil war going on for 13 years already. So um, that was my first mission. Second mission, I, w I went to Uzbekistan. I spent another six months there. Supposedly, um, the mission in Uzbekistan is supposed to be uh, a, a more relaxed long-term medical project. But um, unfortunately, uh, September 11 thing happened during, during my, my stay in um, Uzbekistan. So it became an emergency mission as well. After that, I continued my, my uh, emergency relief operations in uh, uh, um, Indonesia during the tsunami and also the year after uh, in um, Kashmir during the, the, the Kashmir earthquake in, in Pakistan. So that's a bit of my, my, my background. And when I was in Sudan, that was me in year 2000 in, in Sudan. I was the only, only engineer in a team of seven because I was with MSF and it's a uh, medical organization. So the six of them are nurse, doctors, midwife, and so on. So I was the only engineer. The reason we have a, such a small team is because um, that is the maximum number of people you can fit into a plane when we have to evacuate. So um, there were seven of us. And I was the only engineer, so it makes no sense to the doctor to tell him that I'm a mechanical engineer, I don't fix radio. <laughs> so naturally, um, I fixed the radio. And to the nurse, oh, Albert is a mechanical engineer, so um, I guess that means he's a mechanic as well. So I fixed the cars. <laughs> yeah. And um, of course, to the midwife, it makes no sense to explain to them, only civil engineers should design and build buildings. And so uh, I took up the job using corrugated plates and uh, local materials to build uh, 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 clinics and hospitals as well. Um, and this, is, uh, this one, I volunteer myself, I build airstrips. 
Airstrips in Sudan is something regular. You do it quite often. You do it every once in a while. And the, the reason is that uh, um, from time to time, the, the government will actually find out where your airstrip is. And when they do that, oh, I, I, I forgot to mention, I, I, I have been a very uh, reasonable, logical person all my life. Even in my teenage year, I was never rebellious. My mom told me that. And, um, <laughs> but when I was in Sudan, I was actually working with the rebels. I was in rebel-controlled area. So my enemy is uh, the government. So the government, from time to time, they will come to bomb us, they will come to attack us and try to you know, uh, scare us and drive us away. So sometimes when they fly in the sky, when they see our airstrip, they will send us a note and say, um, we know where your airstrip is, so if you continue using it, don't be surprised to see us when you use it. And when we receive a note like that, basically they're trying to uh, threaten us not to use it again. But when we see a note like that, uh, we don't take any chance. We will just abandon the, the airstrip and build another one. So it, it's a regular thing. You know, you, you, you get to do it quite often. It's fun. Um, and um, I'm, I'm proud to say standing in front of you is the best latrine builder in Hong Kong. <laughs> I get to build a lot, a lot of uh, uh, latrines in, in, in my missions in Sudan and Uzbekistan, and I've seen the most horrible latrines uh, uh, ever in, in uh, different countries. Um, I do a lot of trainings. I actually teach a lot of students. Uh, uh, some of the students that, that Matthew mentioned, uh, Sarabi, she was one of my students as well. She learned to build latrines for me. And um, I actually train professional engineers to design and build latrines. So that's how good I am. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, like I said, uh, the government, they, from time to time, they will come to attack and, and destroy whatever facilities we have and try to scare us away. And, um, um, yeah, that, that, that creates a lot of trouble. But during peaceful time, we, we do have proper place to, to stay. Uh, in Hong Kong, it's a big deal when you tell people you have, a, you have your own house. But uh, in Sudan, I, I do have my own house as well. That was, and uh, what comes with my own house is my private bomb shelter. Um, in Sudan, well, at least back in year 2000, I think until now, um, the war that they fought was not very high tech. They don't have laser guided missile uh, uh, to, to, to bomb you. When they want to bomb you, they will fly a plane high in the sky, and yet when they see something that worth bombing, they will, someone very brave will stand in the back of the plane and kick down a large diesel drum. And what's is inside the diesel drum, there's no, usually there's, I don't think there's any explosives inside. What it is is they have a lot of bits, bits and pieces of sharp metals and everything. So from very high, high in the sky, um, gravitational pull um, um, draws it to the ground, and the impact will drive all the sharp pieces roughly 30 degrees angles uh, above the, the ground. And if you, if you stand up like this, then you, know, you, you, you get hit. But if you're fast enough, you lay down, then you're very likely to survive. And if you have time to dive into one of these bomb shelters to make yourself below, the ground, below ground level, then um, yeah, you, you, you're pretty, pretty safe. So even if it's very primitive, um, it, it, it serves the purpose. Um, and because of all this experience, um, before my experience with, with, with MSF, I've been working in engineering firms all my time. But since this experience, it totally changed my, my understanding of my profession. Certainly, I have a purpose. I have a sense of purpose for my profession. I understand the reason that, that uh, engineers, are, uh, there's such a profession of engineers is that we can use technology to serve, to help the local population, to help the people in developing countries to actually uh, um, improve their living and, and, and as to the control of life through our, the, the kind of technology we have. So my research interests and my work totally changed. I start to look into technology that can actually help to, to make a better living. And this is one of the examples. Uh, I use Wi-Fi network so I can put sensor three kilometers up, uh, upstream of a river and it will detect the fluctuation of water flow. So if there's such a, suddenly a flood, then three kilometers down the, the red alarm will go off. And so the villagers crossing the river or crossing the bridge can speed themselves up and then they, won't, they can get out of the river before, before the flood arrives. Um, I designed search and rescue robots as well because I've been serving in three different uh, uh, earthquake missions and it's just totally heartbreaking to, to see and hear people 
uh, under, under rubble. So this technology is so cheap. It's less than 20 US dollars per piece. And it has a Wi-Fi. It has very simple sensors. So I can afford to send 1,000 pieces of them into the rubble. And they will just keep crawling until they find a, a, board, a, a heat source that, that is similar to a, to a living body. And when they do that, they will, they will send Wi-Fi signal and triangulate and tell the operator where, where exactly the, the robot is. And then the operator can speak through one of the microphones and tell the, the, the victim and say, uh, we know where you are, stay alive, we will try to come to find you. Even it might be a false statement in the end, but at least we can give hope to the victim. Unfortunately, all this technology didn't, didn't, didn't sell. Uh, uh, we started a company with, with some of my friends to try to sell all this technology, but it didn't work out. What actually worked out is another technology that we, 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 we came up with. If, um, before we, we started to design this project, we didn't know that 3% of the vegetated landmass in, in, in the world are being destroyed by wildfire every year. And the smoke produced by the, the wildfire kills 340,000 people every year. So it's a major problem. And especially if we talk about sustainable development, we have to look for new energy sources, new resources to, to sustain our development. But at the same time, we have to protect what we already have. So we designed this uh, um, uh, robots to try to protect, uh, uh, prevent wildfire from happening. And here's the second part of the story. In the very beginning of my, 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 my talk, I mentioned, I, I, I share with you my worry. When we want to serve the other 80% of the population, how are we going to have enough innovators and leaders to lead the changes? And I share with my, my, my colleagues my, my, my own experience. Because since I, 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 the, the year I worked with MSF in, in developing countries, I never went back to, to, to engineering firm again. I, I went back to college to, to do my degree and start to research in appropriate technology. And then I start to work on um, develop a course like this one called uh, Appropriate Technology for the Developing World. And I organized a lot of different kind of activities to try to help our younger generations um, to develop a sense of purpose so that they will also join, join the workforce to become innovators and leaders for the other 80% of the population. And here's the result. Um, this group of students, they have been um, um, working on the same projects for six years already. They have been keep going back to Ghana during the winter, during the summer, to build latrines, to build water and uh, sanitation facilities, and they have been doing uh, hygiene promotion six years by themselves. They look for their own resources, we provide them the training, and they've been doing it uh, un until now. Um, a lot of different group of students, they have been visiting different provinces in China, doing roughly the same thing. They look into the medical waste management system, they look into the water and sanitation system to try to improve the hygiene level in rural China. And students, um, on Saturday and Sunday, instead of going to Lang Guifang to have beer or hanging out with their, their boyfriend and girlfriends, they would actually come to me and try to learn how to build, a, build, build latrines and, and try to improve their design so they can, they can uh, improve their projects in, in um, different parts of the world. That is my three years old daughter trying to explain how to use a latrine properly. <laughs> and then we have students um, designing uh, uh, modifying um, uh, um, um, design of stoves so to improve the combustion and so to uh, uh, minimize the amount of carbon monoxide being emitted um, during combustion. This is particularly useful for, for, uh, for countries where it's cold and the kitchen don't have chimney. And then another group of students, they went to the north of Thailand to try to install a conventional uh, um, hydropower generator. But what they learned is um, the, 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 the river next to the village is actually, the, the flow rate is too slow, so it doesn't work. It doesn't even activate the, the generator. So they came back to Hong Kong and then they worked with their professor and designed this kind of uh, uh, generator that will actually uh, work on, on, on river that, that has very uh, low uh, flow rate. Um, so um, I can continue to, 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 to uh, uh, showcase our, our students' projects, but um, um, I'm going to wrap up. But um, 
we, we have some very, very uplifting uh, uh, figures. Uh, so far, we have 18, uh, in, the, in the past five years, in the past five years, we have 18,000 students engaged in over 600 projects and serve 92,000 people around the world. And this was only in the last five years. And um, please consider that our university is the largest in the world. We have only 16,000 students, 16,000 undergraduate students. And all this work being done, they don't carry any credits. Students don't get any credit. They don't get a grade, they don't get credit. And they're doing it totally out of volunteerism. So um, um, my, my, my belief is that if we can help students to develop a sense of, of mission, a sense of uh, uh, responsibility, I think we have a very good chance in turning uh, enough students into the future in innovators and leaders for the other 80% of the population's need. Thank you.